Welcome back to the Mole Pigs podcast. Today, our guest is Ashwin Gopinath. Also here today are Boya. Hello. Yorgos. Hello. And I'm Eric. Unfortunately, Hannah cannot join us, so you're stuck with me as host. To introduce our guest, Ashwin received his PhD in electrical engineering from Boston University, working on devices for detecting and characterizing single biomolecules. Challenges he encountered during this motivated him to switch his focus from optical physics to DNA nanotechnology, leading to a postdoc under Paul Rothman at Caltech. After working briefly at Google X, he is now an assistant professor at MIT and has received the Robert Dirks Molecular Programming Prize for his work combining DNA nanotechnology with conventional microfabrication. Ashwin, hi. Hi, Eric. It's fun to be here. Yeah, excited to talk to you. Um, so I guess to start, um, you, you mentioned in your introduction on your website that your PhD was a partial success. Can you tell us more about that and how that, that frustration led you to DNA nanotechnology as a partial solution? Yeah, so so I started my PhD in in a neurobiology lab. We were trying to understand how glia differentiates into uh, like progenitor cells differentiates into either glia or neurons. Uh, but then uh, nobody told me that I'll have to kill baby mice to do this research. So about after about a year, I switched and I started working on this kind of abstract question of what does it mean to generate random numbers? Like how random can you get? And what does it mean in like optical physics and things like that? And that led me to this uh, set of experiments wherein we were trying to do localization of light on these uh, collective arrays where you can have specific location wherein photons can get localized. And why did we want to do that? We wanted to do that because we wanted to have light matter interaction enhanced at that particular location. So if you have a single molecule in a particular location wherein you have uh, photons that are trapped, then you would be able to characterize it much better. And we were doing Raman spectroscopy and things like that. The data suggested that I was able to see things as small as single molecules. I was getting Raman signals from few molecules. However, it never sat right with me because in the sense that the experiment suggested uh, I got something, but it was done through titration of molecules. We never actually put a molecule exactly where I wanted, constructed a structure around it, and then analyzed it. It was sort of like you kept titrating down a particular molecule. Eventually, statistically, you might have only a few molecules in a particular field of view, and you're getting a signal from it. Therefore, it is a single molecule. Mm, Didn't sit right with me. So that took me on an adventure to uh, Paul's lab, where uh, we started playing around with DNA origami to uh, what what was supposed to be, in my mind, half a year of, uh, I'll get in there, there's a paper, let's finish this, get get it done, I'll have another paper and move back to phys- optical physics. It ended up becoming, you know, a much, much longer adventure. And now I do optical, they do optical physics in my lab. We do microscopy, but we don't really push the limits on it. It's not as exciting as all the other cool things that you can do. So how did you find Paul Rothman's lab? Oh, uh, uh, how did I find Paul Rothman's lab? So uh, my uh, thesis committee had uh, this individual named Franco Serena, who was uh, a key individual in uh, creation of NimbleGen. Uh, That was a microarray uh, company. They did optical uh, lithography of uh, DNA microarray chips. Uh, And he had met uh, Paul several years back or something like that. So when I was talking to him about the problems that I was facing with my experiments, he said, talk to Paul. And uh, this was about six months before I graduated. I sent a mail to Paul and completely as Paul puts the story, he had just got literally that day, he was actually writing a, a description for a postdoc position, which is like, he just got a grant for doing exactly what I wanted. And here it was that I sent a mail saying, I want to do this exact thing. And that's the way he tells the story. I don't know if that is true or not. Uh, but 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 I just cold emailed him and he basically was like, okay, fine, come hang out. And, you know, we started collaborating. It's amazing serendipity, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how, how hard was it for you to jump from optical physics to DNA nanotech? Did you find the experiments relatively easy to do? Or was it 
kind of learning new things for you as well? Uh, so for me, it was interesting. Like DNA nanotech community was interesting at that point because I came from a field and I came from a lab that was uh, that had a very different philosophy, uh, wherein it was more publish, 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 you know, minimum publishing unit and just basically push it out because the community uh, around uh, uh, like optical physics and plasmonics at that time had that kind of attitude, collective attitude. The thing that was interesting to me was uh, the DNA nanotech community, at least at the time that I started, like 10, 10, 11 years ago, was still relatively new, wherein the communications between the different labs and PI were much more open. Like I went to, uh, there was this multiple university large grant that uh, Caltech was part of, which was called MPP, Molecular Programming Project, first molecular programming project. And I met all the individuals and it, it, I mean, that's what kind of attracted me to the DNA nanotech more than necessarily the technology. The fact that it was an open uh, field and nobody in the field other than probably Paul and uh, Eric and Bernie and a few others uh, w- could be called as veterans of the field. The field was very ill-defined. It was uh, sort of like a ragtag group of different PIs trying to play with this new form of fabrication tool. And that that made it much more exciting and it also made it much more interesting so it was not very difficult because nobody no rules were set at that time and and it's no long it's it's very unfortunate that it is no i don't get that feeling anymore in the community because it's sort of like it's grown and there are like rules and uh, you know how things are done is sort of defined uh, at, at like at that point, origami was still relatively new. It was like there were there were pieces that were missing. What could you use it for? If you want to attach a nanoparticle, how can you stabilize a nanoparticle? What do you do? And and so so that created a very very interesting environment that made it very easy to transition in because nobody was a veteran of the field. I was actually going to follow on and ask, um, like, what is or what do you mean by DNA origami two point Oh, okay. So DNA Origami 2.0. So I I loved Origami. I mean, Origami is awesome. But the thing that bothered me about DNA Origami always is the fact that it was DNA. And DNA from a material perspective had its limitations. You couldn't arbitrarily change uh, the environmental condition and keep its properties. So, so, so that is to say, uh, if I take a DNA origami, make it into some kind of six helix bundle or anything, and I want to I wanna now move it into an organic media, uh, like I want to put it in hexane and grow something on top of it. Or if I want to, uh, let's say, grow some 3-5 material on top of it. Or I want to use it uh, uh, um, as, let's say, some kind of uh, tagging agent. Like, let's say if I want to make an MRI contrast agent out of that, how do I actually do all of these things? And so the, from a material point of view, it had limitations. So uh, what we were trying to do, it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, title as well. It was sort of like keeping all the properties of DNA origami, uh, that is to say the organization uh, of molecules, the relative uh, distribution of molecules, the shape, the size, all of those things, but be able to completely convert into a different material. So that the DNA, at least the chassis, the core body doesn't look like DNA anymore to the outside world. So the uh, the the main advantage was it's it's sort of building on uh, William and uh, Thorsten's work uh, independently. They did the polyplexing work, and the polyplexing work allows you to make it stable in. Uh, biological settings wherein like enzymatic degradation and all of that goes down but also it makes it much more stable in organic media where material synthesis works very well and while the enzymatic degradation 
is reduced in with uh, polyplexing, it's not completely eliminated. But if you start growing silica on top of it, no enzymes are degrading silica, not anytime soon. It gets sequestered back into, uh, like it gets cleaned up uh, by the lymphatic system, but uh, it's not going to get degraded. So that was that was where we wanted to go. So we wanted to open that entire, you, you, we didn't want to be limited by the material limitations of DNA anymore. Yeah, and I think it was Oleg Gang that showed that you could silicize a DNA crystal and then put it under like one gigapascal of pressure and it would stay intact, right? Um, so uh, does your lab also work with the silicization or do you guys have other interesting material modifications to make to a DNA structure? The short answer is we'll go where um, we have a vague direction that we want to go. Like my 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 uh, area, the thing that I want to try to solve at this point is I I want to see how how finely one can actually measure molecules in all sense of that term. So that is to say, how sensitive can I make it? How broadly can I measure it? Can I measure, let's say, uh, 10,000, 15,000 molecules at the same time? Uh, you know, what is the maximum dynamic range that I can actually get there? As well as can I measure all of these things at the same time temporally? Because eventually where we want to get to is being able to measure all the relevant molecules that are there in a biological system in real time. So uh, how does, let's say, rather than measuring glucose, can I measure insulin? Can I measure, uh, let's say, if you are going to take a chemotherapy drug, can I measure the metabolism of the drug? Can I, like, if you are going to take opioids, can I actually measure how the opioids are being metabolized in your body? Or, uh, you know, at what point can I look at the patterns of, the, of proteins and small molecules in your body and be able to predictively say whether you have possibility of a particular disease manifesting? All of these things. So, so that's where we want to go broadly. But the technology for that doesn't exist. And, and so, so we are at that building up the technology layer. And DNA uh, loves me. At least it's a... It's a interesting enough material or it's a material that's compatible enough with all the different players in this problem that we can create tools but if we find a better material and better solution i'll move on to it in a heartbeat so it's like a means to an end so is this the technology that leads to you um having your own company can you tell us the story of that oh okay so palmetrics came about uh it was uh since I published my paper, uh, the the Van Gogh paper in like, I think 2016, uh, me and Paul have been like thinking about, or I've been trying to push Paul to, uh, you know, jump on board and like start a, a company around that technology. And that never happened for many reasons. I mean, we, we thought about it and we, you know, the time was not right and things like that. Then I started my lab at MIT and... Uh, what happened was uh, literally I got the keys to my lab on the same day that the lockdown started. Like I have an email wherein I have like two sets of email wherein like 15 minutes apart. Here is your key. Your 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 lab is renovated. 15 minutes later, oh no, you can't get into the lab because it's lockdown. So so sort of like frustrated by that, I gave a call to like uh, a friend of ours, uh, uh, and then um, we were like, okay. It's as good as any. We are we are we are trapped in the house. We'll just start. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, starting a company around this. Let's start it. And uh, uh, and it was sort of trying to answer one part of the question. It was sort of like how 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 sensitively can you measure and how broadly can you measure protein concentrations? And so we wanted to take. Uh, we took um, single molecule ELISA. Uh, like sandwich ELISAs and refactored it onto these grids uh, that we form by DNA origami. So every single spot behaves like a sandwich ELISA. And uh, if it captures a protein, it lights up. And then, you know, there are different tracks you play to basically do multiplexing and uh, uh, stuff like that. But but that's that's the story of how that happened. guess the pandemic wasn't all bad, eh? Um, so when you... We're running Palomatrix. How much of your time was spent running your lab at MIT and how much of it was spent interfacing with this company, which I believe was based in San Diego, right? And were you basically having to fly back and forth a lot? Yeah. So 
I, I had to I had to fly back and forth a lot, but so pandemic helped in some ways, but because uh, we went remote, and I was uh, remote anyway because my wife is based in San Francisco, so uh, and I had like we 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 set up base in San Francisco anyway we were during during my Google time, and so it was what it was. I mean, it it ha- uh, like pandemic sort of allowed us to explore new ways of collaboration and new ways of working so it's interesting and uh, to answer your question of time commitments it's sort of uh, i am very fortunate like i said to have extraordinary students and postdocs so sort of like if i go into the lab if i touch something i often end up breaking stuff so the truth that most pi's don't love to say or admit is that once you become a pi you are a glorified editor and uh, you like to come up with like ideas on a whiteboard but uh, your lieutenants and your soldiers have to be awesome and i've been fortunate enough to have some really really amazing folks so uh, that they make my life a whole lot easier allowing me to you know explore these other things like starting companies and stuff like that can you say a little bit about whether or not there's any difference in management style between managing an academic lab versus managing a team at a corporate environment? So the thing that uh, nobody tells you, um, it's it's sort of true even when you look back at it, even in academic environment is the productivity of a lab or a productivity of an organization has less to do with the technology that they are working on and uh, more to do with the interpersonal relationships and the culture that you bring to the table um and one thing that definitely is true uh in an uh, in a startup is that uh, it's much more mission driven wherein uh, you have to get certain results done and there is uh, uh it it re- and you have to ultimately create a product that somebody is going to buy uh and uh it is not vague in terms of you have to get some result that might get published and then you have to massage the results so you make sure that you get published in a big enough journal uh because so running a company or productizing something is a little bit easier it's all, but it's also actually much more difficult in practice because ultimately you know you can say i have created the most beautiful technology but if nobody is willing to buy it it means nothing so so you can't like you can't uh, you know massage the graphs and like interpretation and like uh, and and put a you know interesting introduction and interesting conclusion and push it into nature science because that can be done with, with results uh, you know recontextualize it but with products if you create something if nobody's going to buy it you can stand there and say i have created the perfect technology you ought to love it won't happen so it's a little bit harder but it's also a little bit easier because you don't have these kind of distractions it's much more easier it's like it's you can be very focused and you can have a team all of who are working on a singular mission it's not everybody trying to get their own first authorship paper their own uh, you know sub contribution to this larger project and things like that so so that's a big difference and it's actually a it's it's very welcoming difference So what's the story of like your reason sell of your company to Soma Logic? Uh, so multiple reasons, right? So there's this uh, really nice video on uh, what makes uh, the a company or a startup a success. I think it was by the founder of Idea Labs and they did this multiparametric analysis to kind of ask the question is it the team that makes a uh, company successful is it the technology is it the money and all of these things and turns out the singular predictor of success of a particular company is the timing and uh, the timing or timing of uh, you know getting into the market or basically forming the stuff 
So while I can claim again that, uh, you know, our technology was singularly awesome, the time that we started the company was also great. But then we we were towards the tail end of the biotech bubble uh, in some sense. So while I can say that if we had struggled on, uh, we would have eventually been successful. It was sort of cost benefit analysis. You know, it's sort of like, is it going to take 10 years to become successful? And, and, and there is this period wherein we saw very clearly that the economic, like the, the biotech bubble was bursting. And we were like, okay, we have two choices, either, you know, let go of it or, you know, struggle through several years of fundraise and, you know, and getting things to go. So, and we made a, we made a choice and it seemed like, you know, at the time and even now, Somalogic had certain assets, uh, like affinity binders, uh, which Palmetrix could use. And is your involvement also changed after selling to Somalogic? Significantly, significantly, I am, I am, I am sort of like working my way out of that. So there are still relevant, relevant things that I mean, when you when you start something, but 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 but, I I mean, I look at it as you know, sort of like Palmetrix was a certain arc of my life was a certain story that story is sort of ended and uh, it's a sort of like it's a project is ended it's handed off to somebody else and they will make what they make out of it uh, uh, there is a larger mission that you know i need to solve i mean that solves that solves some part of the large mission that i had or like or that that my lab still has which is sort of you know how broadly can you actually measure? But it doesn't solve many of the other problems. That that was a technology that solves a particular problem a particular way. And, you know, they are productizing it and they'll they'll make it what they make it. So do you basically view your mission as a scientist to kind of seed ideas through the world and build up a series of technologies that can solve a series of problems rather than it being your particular technology? No, 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 no. I, I, the, the, the singular thing that I want to actually bring about is I don't think people view healthcare with the seriousness that it deserves. Like in the sense that I, I, I think, uh, and, and, and that is not to say I'm not, I'm not trying to kind of poo poo, uh, doctors and researchers or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, uh, like, we have technologies that are, you know, I would I would think about it as one or two miracles away. That when when I say miracle, I mean like I I, I look at any grad student finishing their PhD with a good set of thesis as a miracle. So I think about it as uh, uh, you know. So if you have like one or two good PhDs away from some really awesome technologies. So being able to view your, so if you look at your body or any kind of biological system as truly a connected complex system, then if you can take a snapshot of all the constituents there, and if you have multiple instances of it with phenotypical information, you will be able to reconstruct the phenotypical information purely from the system information. So that is to say, if I take all the uh, proteins and small molecules in your body and your genome, and if I were to take a snapshot of it, it's like at, you know, 9.30 uh, uh, a.m. in California, my, you know, 7,000 or 10,000 protein values is some value. This is my genome and this is my set of small molecules in my body. Now, if I, it's, I posit that, that information tells you everything about your health at that particular point. The question is, how do you interpret it? If you need to interpret it, then you need to have similar to, uh, uh, you need to have large data where you have collected that raw information and phenotypical information. Do correlational studies similar to how you did GWAS and to be able to interpret the patterns. For that, you need to develop technologies to be able to measure everything cheap enough uh, so that you can actually measure this. And once you interpret it, how do you actually come up with ways to get people to use it and all of these things? So I want to bring about that mode of healthcare. That's my mission. And, and it just so happens that nobody is building. If that technology existed, I would gladly go use it and try to build something out of that. 
but if that doesn't and 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 that doesn't exist so i have to build it that's it and and part of the reason why i'm getting to this is because like my wife was diagnosed with like uh, 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 leukemia uh, back when we both were like uh, when i was a uh, postdoc and she was a grad student at uh, caltech and that fundamentally sort of changed uh, the way in which we were thinking about uh, uh, sort of healthcare in general so i i want to live in that world and the technology doesn't exist for that so i'm building it if the technology happens then the next question is how do i get people to use it so when you say people like aren't taking medicine seriously i do mean kind of they're they're too siloed in like one biomarker one phenotypic outcome whereas you think that the the actual answer is to be much more holistic and much more uh integrative in your uh medicine approach such that you take into account the system, how the system is behaving as a whole. Is it, I kind of have that idea correct? Correct, correct, correct. I mean, like, for instance, if your computer is basically slowed down, you're not going to ask there, okay, what is the one, you know, particular uh, uh, thing that went wrong or one particular software uh, that basically is causing the slowdown? It might be the case, but most often than not, it's a series of things that basically knock on to each other that causes any kind of problems. So, I mean, that's that's not a that's not a good enough exa- uh, uh, example. Maybe I mean it's it's hard to come up with complex system examples of complex systems wherein it's viewed holistically. I mean, like where or wherein it is not viewed holistically. Like when you have a car trouble, uh, you know, you I don't know. I mean, I I mean maybe maybe these are not the right examples. It's like I'm I'm ha- having a hard time imagining what would be a right example to bring up there, but. and and again this is sort of intuition and which is sort of supported by emerging papers that you need to view biological systems in its full complexity and we don't have tools to even view it yet so that kind of makes for an interesting segue into what you've been posting a lot about on your blog recently which is artificial intelligence do you kind of view artificial intelligence as the way we're going to handle this integration since it can handle so much like larger data or are you more focused on artificial intelligence and how it can interface with humans oh so the the whole adventure with the ai sort of began uh, began because uh, there were too many papers so so there there are too many papers that are coming out uh, and i can't keep track of it so i started coding up uh, a little tool for myself wherein i just take the entire bibliography and it uh, does a semantic search on the entire bibliography and i started i mean it was a really really badly written code for myself and then i i found a bunch of students and uh, it turns out uh, uh, we 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 built a tiny little system wherein you can just put in any arbitrary books or any kind of youtube video or any say kind of things and you can start interacting with it so it evolved into something a little bit bigger and it's just sort of snowballing it's like taking its own life right now uh the ai and and we are we are exploring i mean there is a paper that should be coming out in the next couple of days wherein uh, we've been playing with uh, how do you actually get self reflection in ai and we are trying to do that for we are we are designing that for protein design so that is to say if you give a particular protein target it uh, semantically tries to tries to create the structure and then uh, when it fails or it doesn't hit the target it asks itself uh, you know why did i fail and uh, come up with hypothesis uh, in natural language and uh, it reruns it so sort of like how can you actually come up with that system and what does that system look like and does it actually perform better uh and so we have like the core agent the core architecture should be out in the next couple of days but we are trying to plug that into molecular design so much more precisely now the question is if you are trying to design an origami what is your design process or if you are trying to design a molecule you will go you have certain knowledge you will try to design something and you have some measure some heuristics by which you say did i actually design it or not and if you didn't design it you're going to stare at your design and you're going to come up with hypotheses as to why you failed and you will try it again now can i systematize this entire process and let it loose so uh like so that's that's where we are going so the first step of that that should be out in the next few days 
but then we are applying that to molecular design which will take a little longer so it seems that your um, research philosophy is very practical focused so i wonder uh, how do you develop this kind of uh, research philosophy as described in your website like do you, did you um, go through some trial phases on theory and realize that, oh, you didn't enjoy it? Or did you have a passion about practical and experimental investigation found early on? So so partly being around, being in Caltech and being in Paul and Eric's lab radically changed the way in which I thought about science. I think more than anything else, I feel like Caltech, of, I've been associated with different organizations and universities, but I think more than anything else, I think those two labs kind of define what I think of as being scientists, uh, like thinking about it in a certain way and not like wh- wherein you don't think about it strategically from an academic point of view. What I mean by that is Many times people think, and, and, I, and, I, and I hate that academic community has become this, wherein as soon as an idea comes in your mind, you're asking the question, can I get a paper out of it? That's the wrong question to ask. The, wrong, the, the question is, what is a problem that you're trying to solve? And is your work actually moving you towards that problem solution? And if you, get, if you do good work in that and you are successful in that, good papers will come. As opposed to asking the question, let's kind of do something and like make sure that we have papers. Okay, and so 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 those set of those labs sort of made made me starkly realize that it's possible to kind of maintain that purity in some sense of doing science and 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 still get away with it. It's hard, and it also requires one to sort of throw caution to the wind to a certain extent because you're doing things that are like way off the left field wherein like you're not trying to constantly publish you're co- you're not constantly trying to go to conferences to give talks you're sitting there and you're like this is the problem that we are trying to solve this is the way in which i have a particular vision on these are the steps that i want to do and these are the problems that i need to solve and you go after that one and one after the other and if you get papers out of it great if you don't get papers out of it we'll deal with it i mean Publications has its own problems in academia, but but that's that's that that's I'm not even going to go start with that. And how, how do you get that philosophy past like the tenure committee who are looking for you know publication metrics and conference talks, etc.? Uh, how do I put this lightly? Not caring so much about it. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. It's sort of like uh, it's sort of like you have a you have a choice. I mean, I, I I asked myself this question a while back, and maybe I mean it'll 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 come back to bite me in the ass at some point. Wherein if I I might not get tenure, but it is what it is. Uh, but the question is, and then I'm okay with it. But it's just sort of uh, it's just sort of like you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to spend the next six years or seven years of my life basically constantly stressing out and writing papers and chasing things and doing stuff? chasing problems or chasing playing a game whose rules are set outside me or do I want to actually build something that I want to build and uh, you know at the end of the day you know you have a choice so and I'm choosing to uh, you know hold steadfast and we'll see where it goes we'll see where it goes it's it's sort of worked out for me so far Uh, maybe the luck will run out at some point if that's the case there's something else to do so you know, I don't want to play the game by somebody else's rules. That sounds very free. Um, does that also explain like why you, um, I saw that on your research website, you have very detailed description of the project you're, that you're interested in. Is that also partly explain what like style of open research? Yes. Yep. I mean, I've been trying to tell my postdocs and grad students, you know, as soon as you have results, just put it out there. It's okay. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, sitting and worrying about it is just sort of like not going to help. I mean, uh, you will, you might get it into nature. You might get into science. It might, I mean, I think, I think, like I said, what I want is technologies that allows me to answer certain problems, like solve certain problems. It doesn't matter whether it comes out of my lab or it comes out of some other lab. I think the problem needs to be solved. 
uh, and and you know I'm not going to try to claim that you know the problems that I'm trying to solve is as big as like climate change or anything like that. But it like those are places wherein it actually matters. Like publications and uh, the pace at which publication is done, like it it hurts it because if if climate change really needs to be solved and and these kind of big issues need to be solved, then you want to put out you want to collectively work on solving the problems. Okay? Everybody should be like, and, and the pace of innovation will be a lot be- lot more if you just put out your ideas. Who cares whether you're doing it or somebody else is doing it? Like if somebody else like takes some of these ideas and actually works on it and develops something, great. It solved my problem. I don't need to solve it. As long as I can reproduce it, I'll build on it. And so I've noticed from looking at like your Google Scholar that recently there's been a ton of patents overlap. And I, see, I, th- I think a lot of those are Palomagix related stuff that only finally got granted. But is that kind of your way of saying, okay, we did this as in like the grand vision of single molecule detection? Not, not really, right? Like, so, so patents in a startup or like in a commercial setting, you know, is, is purely from a strategic point of view to allow you to work on certain things. So that's sort of the reason why we put it out there. Uh, and uh, there are a bunch of other patents that have come out soon from my lab itself, uh, but those have to wait a little bit. I mean, th- those are those are still sort of cooking. Uh, but uh, patents are, p- p- unfortunately, patents are the way in which uh, deep tech works. I mean, it's it's sort of you know we can have a that's a that's a longer debate as to whether it is good or bad. Uh, there's a lot of stories there as well. So. Just because you have a patent doesn't mean that uh, you can work on certain areas. And just because a publication has happened, it doesn't mean that you can't still patent it. There's a whole bunch. It's a it's it's a tangled web. Very true. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit more about how you took those ideas from working with Paul and Eric's lab at Caltech and then transplanted those to your own lab. Um, how does that really influence the creation of the lab culture that you are focused on that you seem to be trying to implement as well so so my lab my job i look at it as my job as a pi is making sure that funding is available uh to play with things and that the students and people in my lab don't have to worry about that and uh trust my team that you know, we will like sort of vaguely make sure that the ship is pointed due north, so to speak. I mean, if you're going due north, it's sort of like it's pointed in that direction. I just need to make sure that, you know, the steering wheel is in that direction and I put fuel, that that there is fuel in the fuel tank. The rest of it is just basically up to the students and I'm sort of like, you have, they have the freedom to mess up and we have a clear understanding as to what they want from the PhD. We have that discussion really early on, wherein do they want to be a PI? Do they want to go into the industry? Do they want to build something of themselves? Uh, or if they don't know, that's also fine. But but the but the question is uh, the question is the the strategy is different because if you want to become PI for whatever reason. Uh, uh, then you need to kind of focus on putting yourself out there, trying to build on your ideas, trying to figure out how to refine those ideas, how to communicate those ideas, build relationships with PIs, you know, build relationships within the community and things like that. But if you want to start a company or if you want to go become a research scientist or something like that, then you need to have exposure and you need to make sure that, uh, you know, they have, they, they do the internships and all of that other fun stuff so that, uh, you know, when they graduate, they are not, they don't think that writing papers is the skill that the industry, you know, rewards because it doesn't. I guess following on from that, how have you, like practically, how do you shape a, a, a graduate student who wants to go into industry, you know, for seven years in graduate school? It's not seven years. It needs to be quicker than that. Well, oh yeah, four or five, maybe. Yeah, yeah, four or five is ideally, but but four to six, let's say. The thing is, 
uh, if they say that they if they say that they want to become a, a PI, one of the things that is essential is we need to kind of learn how to write, like learn how to write and write proposals, and uh, you know learn how to uh, give good presentations in a certain way, and uh, you know expand the ability to collaborate with other PIs that that they are leading themselves. So rather than you know I'll always be there to kind of stand in and just in case they falter to make sure that this is there, but but I want them to lead it because they want to have those relationships with PIs so that when they ask for. Uh, uh, reference letters or anything like that, that there is an existing relationship. Uh, now, alternatively, if it is someone who wants to go into, you know, startup or, you know, or, or uh, you know, industry, it's actually very liberating because that basically means that you don't need to pressure them to write papers or at least like chase after nature science papers, first of all, because it won't help. I mean, it doesn't hurt, but it won't necessarily help. Nobody's going to basically say, I'll give you a senior scientist or like some staff scientist or some position because you had a nature paper. Very rare. Very rare. So, you know, what are the, what, what are the things, what are the skills that are needed there? And make sure that they have uh, breadth as well so that they are not sort of so narrow if they are doing DNA nanotech, they're not only thinking about DNA nanotech. They're thinking about things beyond it. Like, let's say, you know, high throughput proteomics, high throughput genomics, or if you want to go into, let's say, uh, drug development, how do you actually think about that? Uh, you know, whether it is internship or like through collaboratively, like getting them to go to conferences or whatever it is. But ultimately, it is sort of like, at least for me, it's to make sure that I have that communic conversation with my students and even postdocs early on and continue to have those conversations. I mean, because otherwise it's just sort of you're training them to become another pi that's the typical way in which most uh graduate school goes through i mean and and and, and that ultimately ends up hurting you so as we get close to the end of time here i always like to ask a like kind of forward looking question um and so you've you, you've been through a lot of different research environments you, you've worked in academic labs you've worked for google like this big company you've led a small company and now you're really focused on how AI can change our uh, in, our interaction with the science. How, how do you see science changing as this technology develops and as um, different ways of leading labs becomes more common? So one thing, one thing that I am sort of looking forward and I'm getting, I'm going to get like a perverse pleasure from seeing this happen is just sort of like the way in which uh, generative AI is going to basically destroy uh, grant writing and uh, academic publications. It is going to. I mean, it is only a matter of time. I mean, I, because because I can churn out uh, papers if I want, uh, you know, extraordinarily fast. And if I'm uh, using that for like grant writing, I can I can put out a grant pretty much every day if I want. And if I have a core grant kind of written, I can make themes and variations of that constantly. So uh, just like there was this uh, very famous um, sci-fi comic uh, that had to turn, down, turn off its uh, submissions because of the deluge of uh, submissions that they ended up getting, I see that happening in NSF, NIH, DOD, every granting agency. If they open it up, they're going to have like, you know, tons of submissions. We are just beginning of what we are going to see there. It's the same thing that is going to happen with uh, academic publications as well. Like, how can you stop somebody from, you know, you, you don't stop somebody from doing using spell check. It's, it's as simple as spell check to generate or like themes and variations of the same idea. And, and you can't keep up with it. It was all the strain of academic publications was already being felt by academia. This is just going to make it worse. It's going to be interesting to watch this change. However, there is also opportunity for interesting stuff to happen. Like for, for, for instance, you can have completely autonomous learning. Like you don't necessarily need a lecturer or like a professor to teach you a lot of things. So that makes a lot of that, that makes uh, uh, life a lot easier. Uh, AI, you know, all, all the, all the fun stuff that can come out of, you know, throwing this unstructured data uh, or uh, uh, into some kind of, uh, uh, singular database and looking for unsupervised uh, learning on that corpus, that would be interesting. That's coming, but uh, we just have to see when that happens.
Sorry, I have a little puppy here. That's why. Do- dogs are always welcome on the podcast. Um, so on that note, I assume based on your answer that you've been using ChatGPT in your like r- writing day to day recently. How how has that experience been? So I don't use I don't use ChatGPT often in my writing because it's just sort of uh, the way in which I the way in which I use ChatGPT uh, is uh, uh, not ChatGPT necessarily. I have like my own little scripts for doing some of these things. Uh, uh, what I do is I have an initial draft of ideas. Uh, that I basically write down that wherein, wherein literally like bullet points. And I have a corpus of other data that basically I have, uh, I appreciate and basically like the design of like the style of. And I basically, what I do is I, I ask my tools to write, rewrite my bullet points in the style that I want. So that makes it uh, like out pop. So I can basically, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable to actually even state it. But it makes me very uncomfortable to because because it's no longer my voice. It's sort of like amalgamation of voices that I like, the styles that I like, as well as like the points that I want basically expressed in that way. So, uh, but it's coming. Have you ever thought about training a model on a, a, a GPT model on a, a corpus of your own grants and just... Uh churning out grant after grant. That's exactly, that, that, that's exactly, like, I know it can be done. Like, it's not just my grants. It's like a whole bunch of other grants that I have basically access to. But when you're starting, a, you, you, when you're starting a, an academic lab, you have your uh, collaborators and your colleagues sort of like share uh, uh, the proposals with you. And uh, I've not explicitly asked anybody as uh, uh, permission for it, uh, but they have shared it with me. So I've basically loaded it into my program uh, and it just basically pops out the style. It's like an amalgamation of that, uh, which is what like I've, I've considered basically making this open source or like putting it out in the world. But it's just sort of like it adds to the noise and it's somebody else is going to do this anyway. I mean, I'm not going to do it as good a job as somebody who's a you know trained software engineer. So I'm using it on my own, like, uh, like these are just simple Google Doc scripts uh, that you can just run. So it runs within Google Doc and it, it, it knows a database of grants from which it has learned the style. So I just need to pick a set of bullet points and say, make a grant from it. It does, there is some nonsense written there, but still it's it's within striking distance. So, and this, I, I am, I am, I am 99% certain and I'm, I, I, I know few people who are also building this out. Uh, 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 this is going to be common in the next year. Is like a year from now, if we are chatting, you everyone will be using this. Guess we had better learn fast. Thank you so much for joining us, Ashwin. Stay tuned to our newsletter or Slack channel for details on our next podcast episode. And thank you for listening.